Hello friends and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast, the show that inspires you to change and live a more exciting life. My name is Ishmael and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or topic that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life, individually and collectively. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. In today's episode, I have the great honor to talk to Paul Millard, who is also a former strategy consultant, having worked for companies like McKinsey, BCG, and so forth, and who is also the author of a book that I like to gift a lot, which is called The Pathless Path, and it has triggered a lot in myself. I do see a lot of overlaps of Paul's path and the path that I'm taking myself. And needless to say, this is a conversation that I was looking forward to a lot, and I'm super excited to share this conversation with you today. And I would love to hear from you how you feel about it and how you think about the pathless path. And in today's episode, we talk about Paul's growing up in a small town in the US, eventually leading him into strategy consulting and pursuing a career in New York City. It did not take long though until Paul felt that there is something missing and he started searching for an alternative to the traditional path. We discussed challenges and opportunities of living a life on the pathless path and we talk about the importance of curiosity and openness to exploring new things. We talk about the value of learning things that you in fact do not like doing and why under-optimizing can be super liberating. You will learn why Paul has no interest in traveling and you will learn how to deal with fear and invite it into your life. Paul calls this the low, slow, stupid fun way. You will also learn about the income to struggle ratio and we discuss the power of going for a walk without any destination and that after all, all of life is uncertain. Paul describes how he reaches high energy states and a lot of happiness and you will learn about his diet and easy tips to stay fit. We talk about role models, people who influenced the two of us and books that have helped us to make sense of life and we conclude with tips and techniques on how to live a more present life. And with that, Paul, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you today is how do you feel and what is on your mind? I feel good. Um, I'm not sure what's on my mind. I kind of Every day I wake up without an alarm clock, so I just kind of roll out of bed and I pretty much have a blank slate. I'm sure we'll talk about some of these things, but um, yeah, I'm usually not filled with a ton of thoughts in the morning. Wonderful. Yeah, because for you, it is in fact in the morning. Where exactly are you calling in from and what got you there? I'm in the US on the East Coast. So I'm staying with my parents now. Uh, we were mostly living in Austin for this year and we came here for a couple months just to spend time with family, see my nephew, uh, other relatives and things like that. Escape the heat too. Wonderful. And maybe we can use that as a little introduction. We got in touch because you are the author of a book, The Pathless Path, which I'm sure we're going to spend quite some time talking about in this podcast episode. But maybe if you don't mind, you could give us a little introduction. Who is Paul? How did you grow up? And yeah, you are already stating that you're in the US visiting family. 
Yeah, so grew up in a small town. I'm in that small town now, about 5,000 people. Um, was always somebody that was kind of like good at school, generally pretty happy. Um, in college, I started to desire what the people around me desired, which was prestige status and success. Um, kind of got pulled into that world for a while, um, led me into the strategy consulting world after like many attempts and failures of trying to break in. I loved consulting and uh, the first few years were amazing. I learned so much. It, it was such a good fit for like what I like doing, which is like turning information into ideas. Eventually, however, I just became increasingly like discontent with my path, I think. Um, I had this deep sense that like I was living the wrong life. And it took me a while to figure out what to actually do with that. But learning um, all these new things and things that were challenging me turned into learning how to talk in a certain way, dress a certain way and fit into what a successful person in like consulting and big companies looks like. I wanted no part of it. I didn't find the men around me all that inspiring. Um, <laughs> like 20 years out, it was like, okay, this is not my path. So I started doing experiments on the side and eventually decided to walk away. And what I discovered was that the feeling of being self-employed was far beyond what I expected. And it sort of poked a hole in a reality I had been living in for most of my life. And I just became curious about that. Why, why is it so weird to quit your job? Why is full-time employment seen as such a, the only obvious and normal thing to do? And where did this all come from? Um, and that's kind of what I wrote my book about, my personal transformation and kind of a exploration of the history, present and future of work. Okay, wonderful. And yeah, this book that you've mentioned, first of all, a big thank you from my side, because yeah, I do see quite a few overlaps in our stories and our paths that we've went so far. I also went into strategy consulting. And then also I started questioning that path and figuring out for myself that this might not be the only reality that we can live in fact and i would be very interested to hear from you when did you start questioning the traditional path i just want to call it for the sake of ease um, and how did that happen you were mentioning that you were starting some side hustles in the beginning like checking out what is possible on the side but when did that start and where are you with that today Probably my first day of working in a big company. Um, even in high school, like I interned uh, for my uncle's company briefly. And I don't know, I just didn't have a good feeling. It just seemed like people didn't want to be in these places. Uh, working at a big company my after the summer of freshman year, like I just gone to college, all these ideas, people were excited, energized for life. And I just found the opposite in this cubicle farm, like these grown men and women just sort of like had no energy and appetite for life. I was like, what the hell? The problem, however, is that I didn't have any imagination for any different path in life. I grew up around mostly people who had built lives around full-time work. There was no reasonable alternative path. Entrepreneurship was not seen as like a smart thing. It was seen as a dumb thing because you were risking guaranteed salaries. So yeah, it, it took me another like 10, 15 years to actually figure out what is a different path look like. Even when I quit, I didn't really have a good imagination of a different path. I felt like pretty bad leaving my job um, because I didn't have much support. People weren't like, oh, this is so great. You're starting your entrepreneurial journey. It's like, why would you walk away from guaranteed salary? This seems pretty stupid. Mm. Especially because I imagine that your network back then of people was built of people from those prestigious strategy consulting people, investment bankers whatsoever, right? So people who actually believe in that career, in that path, 
and people who seek this security and then you did not get all the support because not your whole environment was made up of entrepreneurs who did go or pursue a different path. Yeah, and a lot of people in those paths are drawn to them because they think they'll like the work and that is true often, especially in the early years. But what keeps people in these paths and keep climbing the ladder often is like a fear of exploring anything else. Like the idea that like you might step away and do something else or not keep doing what you're doing is so terrifying for people. So you get surrounded by all this like limited thinking. You think you'd have these people who are like crushing it in their careers, be the most imaginative, biggest dreamers, having the biggest ideas. But it's not really like that. It's like most of the people are just kind of scared. And like, if you mention exploring different paths, you trigger their uncertainty, their insecurity, etc. Including mine. Like, I, I was like that too. Like, I would probably just hand wave dismiss those things. And what happened so that you kind of overcame or at least challenged your fear of exploring something new? After business school, I became sick with what I eventually discovered was Lyme disease. And it took me like a year to recover, uh, a year to like treat it and recover. And during that period, I took a break from work and sort of came to the realization that my entire identity had been centered around work. And I thought that was pretty silly. I read all these things like Bronnie Ware's Five Regrets of the Dying, and basically no one regrets like not working more. Everyone regrets like not being true to who they want, who they were, right? Not bravely going after who they, what they really wanted. And I sort of was like, okay, this, this work stuff, like, all right, on paper, it's impressive to other people, but it's not that impressive to me. And in those months, I think a seed was planted that eventually led me to quitting my job, but it would take like five years. At first it emerged in my life. It's sort of this like curiosity and openness to new things. Um, so I started reading new books. I started exploring new ideas. I started listening to podcasts and eventually that like energy just kept growing and growing. And I started doing side experiments. I wouldn't call them side hustles. Like side hustles is like, it's like, it's like so cringe. <laughs> it's like, it has this idea that like, you're gonna like increase revenue streams. Really it was like side experiments. It was like really leaning into the sense that like, oh, you can just do stuff. You don't need permission. And those things were so energizing and I just kept wanting to try them and do them. And there, there, even when I was doing them, there wasn't a sense that like, oh, I could do this on my own. I had no idea how to like make money on my own. Yeah. And maybe it was not necessarily only about the money or creating revenue streams, but it was really about experimenting with new territory, if you want to say, just to give the audience a little inside what did you first experiment with or what comes to mind that you could share with our audience that you did to figure out different routes when i was sick i started writing a blog and i shared it with friends and family and it was really out of desperation because i needed support and i didn't know how to tell people so writing about it, let me sort of channel and make sense of what I was feeling and share some of my more vulnerable um, realities without like having, <laughs> basically without having to do it in person, which was like too scary for me. Um, and people were really encouraging and supportive. And that was pretty cool. And I liked that. So like writing was always something that kept emerging in my life. I, I would always write like blogs in college, after college, in grad school about different experiences. And yeah, I, I don't know what the first experiment after that was. I think the first experiment was career coaching. 
I started this blog called careers with Paul.com and basically just started writing about career stuff and also just put out there, Hey, I'm going to experiment with career coaching. It was terrifying to do that, but I ended up getting a couple clients that hired me and it was pretty cool. Like it really just pushed my limits. It made me feel extremely uncomfortable. It was the first time I sort of took ownership of something in my life. And from there, I think I just gained more and more confidence to do all these things on the side. What else but the confidence did you learn from those first experiments? And I just want to give you a quick example myself. When I first started this podcast, I was used to talk to board members, CEOs in virtual meetings and physical meetings, talk about numbers, talk about data, you know the drill. But I was really not used to talking to a small little camera or phone and talking to a microphone about topics that actually are important to myself. So I believe I've developed a whole new level or a whole new skill of communication. And I'm sure there is stuff that comes to mind for yourself. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, similar. All, all these experiments, I did a group coaching thing. I gave a speech in front of an audience. Uh, I was writing online. I did like even through just the actual coaching and working with people, they were all new things and they were all out of my comfort zone and all things I didn't really know how to do. So it sort of taught me the meta skill of like, you can learn new things and learning might not be comfortable, but it might also be worth it. Absolutely. And you can evolve from that, right? And that is the whole definition of experimenting that you learn something new and that you can develop from there if this is something that you like. But I'm sure there is also a few activities or skills that you did not pursue. I don't know if something comes to mind if I mention that. Yeah, I, I think it's also just the sense that um, I think the other side of that is there are things you learn that you don't like doing which is almost as valuable. I think the hard thing in full-time employment is you sort of have to do all the stuff you you're doing. And the thing doing experience for my own taught me, it was like, you can sort of decide what you want to work on. You can quit things, you can opt into things and you can take ownership of like having responsibility for having chosen those things. I read your book and I basically do know that there is not a particular standard day in your life. At least that's my assumption. But is there something that you follow every day? Is there certain routines that you wake up with or that you follow that then help you to start a day? Or how, how does a day in Paul's life look like? It's very random. Every day is different. Um, it would probably drive most people crazy, but it really works for me. I don't need to like over plan or over schedule. Um, I have enough things I'm excited about and like enough things I'm committed to that I sort of know like the work will take care of itself. Uh, really the only routine is like coffee. I start the day with coffee and one coffee a day and that's it. Um, pretty much anywhere I go, that's how I kind of like anchor to the day. Uh, mornings are usually pretty slow. Um, I don't have any sort of like morning routine other than like just wake up when I wake up. I don't have an alarm. I haven't had an alarm for seven years and that's pretty much it. What's your natural wake up time? Just out of curiosity, are you a early morning riser or when do you wake up? When do you start your day? It varies a lot. Um, I've still dealt with like some health issues over the past few years. So sometimes when I'm not feeling well, I end up sleeping longer um, or shorter. I don't know. There's no like, I don't have like standard routines or rhythms or I don't really optimize my time or day. I'm very much like an under optimizer. <laughs> hmm. No, and I believe that's also the whole purpose or the whole sense behind this pathless path not having this standardized day and you have to achieve this and that on a particular day on a particular week and maybe we can use that to detail a little bit on this pathless path in your book 
and I want to quote yourself here. You say, um, this is what the pathless path is all about. It's having the courage to walk away from an identity that seems to make sense in the context of the default path in order to aspire towards things you don't understand. So what do you, Paul, understand the pathless path to be? Where does this noun even come from? And when did that evolve? I first discovered it in David White's book, The Three Marriages. And he took his own journey. He quit being like a marine biologist, naturalist, uh, explorer at like early 30s and decided he was going to become a poet. Now, David White is like super well known now, but that was a crazy decision. And he just is a channel for like a lot of wisdom. And he talked about this idea of a pathless path. And he said something like, when you first discover the idea of a pathless path, you're not supposed to know what it means. I actually had the opposite reaction. I was about a year into my self-employment journey and it sort of named something I was feeling. For the first year on my self-employment journey, I tried to tell convince people I knew where I was going. I had a plan. People kept asking, why are you doing this? And I kept trying to like say it. And basically it was also like a denunciation of my previous path. The true reality, if I reflected deep inside was that I had no idea where I was heading. And that was the whole point is that that is sort of the natural state of being. And if we can tap into that natural state, a lot of things open up because all of life is uncertain. But I believe that it also requires quite some reflection and acceptance of that very uncertainty. So I think this is not something that comes overnight. So how did you develop this acceptance or even this appreciation for uncertainty and the unknown? Maybe. I think we're sort of socialized away from that natural state as we grow up. Like we're taught that life has to be planned. You have to rationally think about things. You have to make trade-offs. You have to quantify everything. You have to measure everything. That's not a natural state. That's all like taught to us. And then like people like me who are analytical gravitate towards those things because they make us feel safe, but it's a false safety. It's a safety that says everything can be measured and everything can be okay. If you just earn enough money, you'll be okay. If you just follow this path, everything will be figured out. It's never really true. And it's not like I've solved these things. It's just that I'm more comfortable existing with that uncertain state. Or at minimum, I don't devote most of my time to trying to make the, that discomfort go away which is, I think, what most people are doing in the world these days. People aren't even, I mean, even with like travel, people don't go travel and just exist and be uncomfortable in a different world. They go travel and like consume experiences, right? <laughs> it's like, even when people are supposedly like escaping their default reality, they're still doing sort of the same thing. No, I do agree. And I mean, again, we have some overlaps, which we may or may not detail in this conversations with the Canary Islands, with Taiwan. And maybe we use travel as one of the topics. And I, for myself, together with uh, my partner, Justina, we say we don't really travel, but we live different places. So we choose to live in a particular country on a particular island for three to six months, whatever you want to call it. And we don't travel around, we don't jump from one city to the next, from one experience to the next, but we really try to live in different cultures, try to live different places. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, about what role does traveling or living different places, living with different cultures play in your life? Travel is, yeah, tra travel is something I sort of don't have interest in anymore. <laughs> Like when I go to new places, I don't even want to read about what to see. 
what I love about travel is you can sort of tap into different energies, different realities, different belief systems just by sort of showing up and wandering around and meeting locals and trying new foods and just sort of existing. Like my favorite thing to do is show up in a new place and then just wander around the neighborhood and kind of observe what people are doing and then just try to do that. The biggest benefit of moving to Taiwan after a year after quitting my job was that I finally had distance from the default scripts and default realities of like what you're supposed to do. I grew up in the U.S. and I know exactly what people are thinking about what you're supposed to do. I know exactly how they'll judge me for not doing what you're supposed to do. I know exactly what you're supposed to be striving towards. I know the script for how you're supposed to feel like a failure when you're not making money. In a different country, that all kind of fades away. Because you don't know what people around you really think. Now, eventually spend a long enough time living there and you do discover all the good, bad, and ugly that comes with every country you live in. And this is the real promise of like living in different places is that you can sort of see like every place is beautiful and every place is screwed screwed up <laughs> no absolutely absolutely it depends on the viewpoint and it depends on the time spent in a particular country or place right the more time you spend the more you understand the beauty but the more you also understand what's going wrong or going wrong in your particular personal understanding of things if you want to say right so currently you're somewhere based in between Taiwan and the US or how do you spend a normal year if there is something like that, Paul? <laughs> I don't think I've had a normal year since 2016. I, the longest I've been in any one location has been like any one city, the the longest I was in one city was Taipei from February 2019 to January 2020. Um, the longest I've been in a city since then is like Austin for five months, but we've really lived all over. Even when we were living in Taiwan last year, we only lived in one city at a time for max three months. And yeah, I don't really have a conception of any sort of normal. We just sort of keep figuring it out as we go. Uh, we're headed to Portugal for a month and then back to Austin for 10 months, which will be long again. But um, yeah, I, I don't really fixate on like long-term plans. A lot of people, and I think this is sort of a, a like unnatural human way to exist. Like people are like, Oh, once I have a house, like it's, it's over. Like I'm done. I'm committed to this location. That's it. Right. It's like, I want to fully just commit in the moment. I'm actually in places. I don't think you need a home to do that. Um, but that's how some people imagine they need to do it. No, absolutely. And one very personal story that comes to mind is a question on yesterday's dinner table of the brother of my wife. And he basically asked, so what's your plan for the next five years? And we could give him the next two months being based in Poland and then the next three months being based in Lanzarote, so on another Canary Island for the winter. And that's as much plan as we have. And for the rest, I believe our plan is to be happy and live an exciting life for the next five years. But I believe that most people actually do not get this kind of non-planning, if you want to say. Yeah, and... I think the key there is not like just to figure out who you are, right? There is a large group of people, maybe the majority of humans who just are so uncomfortable if they're not doing what everyone else is doing, that it's just impossible to move forward. And are they ever going to understand like the weirdos like us? No. But, but I do think it matters that weirdos like us are honest about like our desires to keep moving. Right. And it's so easy to fall into the memes of like, you should own a home. You should have stability. You should commit to things. Right. 
we need more experiments in how to live different lives. Like everything is being refactored now. We're shifting from like a stable industrial economy, which was like stable for like 50 to 60 years to like this new tech economy. We have no idea how this is going to shake out. The idea of nation states is going to be refactored. I mean, you're right in the thick of it right there in Poland. Like you're feeling the effects of this. You have all these refugees from Ukraine and like everyone is thinking about what does the future of like a nation state and citizenship and global mobility look like? The truth is we have no idea. Anyone that thinks they have a roadmap of how all this shakes out is like full of shit. <laughs> Absolutely. I fully agree. And I think there is a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. Again, I think that depends on the framing and on your viewpoint coming up for places like the European Union, but also for very different places. I think we can yeah, set that in a global lens. Even there is a lot of change coming. There has always been change, but I think it moves a little bit faster. And yeah, I think it is a global change that we are experiencing for workplace, for ways to live, for ways to engage with each other, really. Yeah, we have more people in dual citizen marriages. Um, we have more uh, people who are refugees than ever. We have more global migration than ever. It's a crazy time and like we need more people who are experimenting in those modes of being and can share wisdom on like, what does this mean? for the world, right? Like the US has been having immigration forever, but we now have like a large majority of people who are like very close minded about the history and like don't want to welcome new people. The reality is if you want a thriving economy, you need constant change and like growth in immigration. <laughs> and like we need more people that are experimenting with that and refactoring that and actually finding out what it feels like to be a new person in a new place. And I love that you say that, like, how does it feel like to be one of those weirdos? And how does it feel like to be a person that is experimenting? And earlier you said that people like us should also be honest about why we are doing it and how does it feel doing some things. And Paul, one thing that comes to mind, I'm sure there is a lot of benefits, but is there also still some fears or challenges that you deal with and that you can also honestly talk about with our audiences? Like, I'm sure there's things that are also on your mind every now and then. Yeah, every day. It's the, the upside of the pathless path is it forces you to face your fears. Um, the downside is you realize they never go away. You can't actually tame your money fears by making more money. That's what people think, but you can tame your money fears by actually experiencing making less and actually learning the truth that existential worries sort of always exist, but you can turn them into abstract fears of like, Oh my God, what will happen if I do this to like, Oh, okay. I'm afraid today. This is a normal feeling. It will fade away or it will just keep coming back. And like, I can, you can learn to dance with it. You can learn to coexist with it. So yeah, I, I still have fears of like not making money of what's going to happen. Um, when we have kids, like, what is that going to look like? Yeah. But the answer for me is not to like compromise all my creativity and like take a boring ass job. It's like to constantly experiment and try and innovate on my path and figure out better ways forward that fit with what I'm wired to do and how I'm wired to show up my best self. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's inspiring that you share this path with other people. And there is another quote or another saying that you use quite a bit that you said when you left consulting, you did not want to create another job for yourself. What did you mean by that, Paul? And do you succeed with that? I had 10 years working in many different jobs in many different environments and i didn't like most of them at the end of the day i wanted to leave all of them i i couldn't last more than two two years and three months in any single job so i didn't want another job 
I wanted something that felt more like a life. And what this meant, and I was probably too afraid at the beginning that things I would commit to would turn into a job. I just sort of became skeptical of monetizing anything too early. I really wanted to orient around like finding the like connectedness and like aliveness in the, in the like moment to moment experience of doing things. So that became my North star. I need to find a state in which I am alive and connected to work. I didn't have that language at the beginning, but it was very clear. Like I didn't want to just monetize something and build a business. Once you start creating online, doing things online, experiencing the power of like networks and different things like that, you realize there's a hundred different ways to make money, but 99 of them, you're just going to be end up burning out after a couple of years. I really wanted to like, I call this the long, slow, stupid, fun way. And it's like, go slower, monetize later than it makes sense like turn down obvious <laughs> money, money pass and optimize for fun and get enough data points before doubling down on something or committing to it such that like you can either quit if it doesn't feel right or you can eventually decide to keep going. So basically you're saying that fun satisfaction or experience is rather your currency than dollar amounts. So that you say you turn down very obvious chances or very obvious income streams in order to experience more and have more fun living the life that you live. Yeah, I probably pushed it too far. Like I really was trying to like spread out my savings to like extend my runway as long as possible. And I cut my cost of living pretty dramatically. Like I, I was really cutting things to the bone um, and probably not experimenting and having enough fun with like creating new stuff. Um, but I think I just needed a lot of time to ease into the journey. It really took me a solid two to three years to find my footing and find my confidence to like figure out how to lean into things I actually wanted to do and scale up. And I want to use that as a little segue. And maybe, Paul, if you could talk to faith and the pathless path a little bit, what role does faith in yourself or in this pathless path play in your life? On a path like this, you don't know what's coming. Now, on the default path in a normal job, we sort of pretend like everything is going to continue as it's continuing. And that's like generally a good bet. Like if you have a job now, you're probably going to have a job, the same job in a year if you don't do anything dramatic. But on, the, on an uncertain path, you really don't know. And that can be terrifying. But you, you have to offset it with like a general optimism or hope that things are going to work out. Now, that might be irrational, but if you can have like sort of a trust that like, okay, things are going to be okay. Like the things I'm doing generally might lead me in an interesting or positive direction or at minimum, like the things I'm doing are not going to blow up my life. And that's probably more important than like succeeding is like having faith that what you're doing is not going to end up with you broke or damaged reputation or anything like that. And I believe in this podcast episode already, but also in your book, you talked that you needed more or less half a year of self-employment consulting work to prove yourself that you have the ability to make money and if everything goes south that you basically have capabilities to come back to life if you want to say so do you want to talk to that a little bit about like the trust in your own skill set yeah making money on your own is really hard uh, i think freelance consulting was the natural thing for me because i had done consulting for 10 years but two things i realized one was that Okay, if you put enough like energy out there and trying to seek out projects, you can eventually find stuff. But two, uh, you might not actually like the work. So it was great that I did it, but it kind of gave me the confidence that I could do it again. But also it gave me an 
anti-purpose, which was that like, okay, I do want to try and make money in different ways because I don't want to solely rely on freelancing. It's a very narrow way of like trying to make money on your own path. And I wanted uh, different options. And talking about different options, what is the different components of your pathless path that you are working on today? I'm aware that this may change and this is a constant change for yourself, but is there certain activities that give you fun, that give you satisfaction? And is there certain activities that you do in order to generate either revenue or to generate safety, a feeling of competence, if you want to talk to that a little bit. I feel pretty confident and like safe and comfortable on my path, but <clears throat> so I don't really optimize around that. Like I just worry, like, I think people think I'm like worried about my path, but it's like, I don't know. I, if I can sort of break even, I'll be happy. Like I don't really have the same financial worries that so many other people seem to have the the thing I focus on is energy. Writing conversations like this give me energy and inspire me and motivate me to keep going. So I really start with that and protect that. If I notice that I'm losing the desire to write or create or have these kind of conversations, then something is wrong. And having these like makes me want to make money to fund this to keep going. So I try to make money in like very high um, income to effort ways. So like the income to struggle ratio is something I think a lot about. This is an idea from my friend Alex Hardy. And um, it's really, it's not about like passive income. It's about like Okay, what are the ways I can generate income such that I'm not actually struggling? So struggling, I mean, in like the basically like what I experienced in full time job. It's like all these things, you know, you have to do to like keep the job. And they're like, oh, it's like super like just heavy lift. I want to mostly try to make money in ways I'm actually excited to make money. <laughs> so they might not be like my dream scenarios, but they're like good enough and they don't zap too much energy that I can continue to doing do the other things. And I believe that this faith in the pathless path has also brought you to opportunities that you would never have thought about before experiencing or tapping into those opportunities. I don't know if there is a few examples that come to mind that there's activities that you may or may not either make money with or get a lot of fun from that you would have no, never thought before leaving the, let's call it traditional path. Yeah, I think I just kept trying experiments. I think a couple things that work in my favor. I love screwing around on the internet. I've always enjoyed playing around with computers. If you don't like that, like making a living online just gonna be really hard. Two is I love just like helping people. And that seems more important to me than making money. So I just show up, keep trying to help people. And a lot of my helping people has turned into things that have made me money. So I'll like create stuff for people and then people will freak out and be like, oh my God, this is so good. You should turn this into something. So I've turned stuff I've done like that into courses and that's led to making money. Um, I like synthesizing my ideas and sharing them with people. So that's been like the newsletter and my book. So that's ended up making money. Um, same thing with like sharing ideas on like YouTube. That's made some money. Um, my podcasts, like it's all the same things, like synthesizing ideas, sharing them with people and looking for opportunities to help people without any goals or purpose. And then just reflecting on those activities and saying like, oh, okay, here's this like obvious opportunity where I might be able to make money. How can I experiment with those? And maybe like five of like 50 of those have like turned into ways where I can actually sustainably keep making money. But those are always shifting and changing. And like, I don't know what the long run mix looks like. I have no idea what everything will look like in three years. All I know is I'm really excited to find out. Oh, that's wonderful. And I want to acknowledge you for sharing your thoughts and sharing all your wisdom with that. And yeah, again, like the pathless path as a book 
is, for example, one that I have happily shared multiple times with very dear friends of mine who are still on this traditional path, like working in private equity, working for the big four, working for MBB. And I do not mean necessarily to get them off track, but I would like to open a perspective. What you shared earlier is there is something else out there that we can pursue if we feel like if you're super happy with your traditional path if you actually also feel that this is the right path perfectly fine right but just to open some eyes just to share some thoughts i think you do a tremendous job paul and yeah again i want to acknowledge you for that thank you yeah what's the reaction from those people because i know sometimes it can be very uncomfortable to start talking about these things but other people do appreciate like just kind of like loosening the veil of like oh these scripts and these stories are dictating our lives and we can kind of refactor them a little so what is the reactions i've gifted those books a good month ago i would say when i finished reading the book myself one friend of mine, I actually spent two days with him and he does not have as much time because he works for private equity and he was halfway through and we talked a little bit about it, but I had the feeling that he wants to finish the book first. He's a very close friend of mine, so I'm sure that we're going to have some conversations about it. That's number one. The second person that I gifted this book to is also a good friend of mine. And I'm not sure he had different plans the last month, let's say. I'm not sure how much reading he has done. So I'm more than happy to give you the in-depth reactions in a month or in two from now. But I'm, I'm absolutely sure that they do some triggering of thoughts and they have already done so. And they have done that for me, even though I'm already on rather a pathless path than on the traditional path myself anymore. But I think it really also helps other people to rethink and question and challenge the path that they are on. And if the outcome, again, is that the path that they are on is the perfect path, go ahead and do it for another three years, five years, 35 years, is this is really what you're seeking. Yeah, I, I think my book is really an attempt to like become more aware of the scripts that or like the invisible scripts that control our lives and then figure out okay given that script am i willing to pay some of the costs for doing these things right full-time jobs are incredible they're amazing ways of like smoothing out income streams in the form of like a job 40 hours a week isn't that much for me, like doing 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year is like unbearable. I just freaking hate it and it destroys my creativity. But for a lot of people, it's fine. It's a pretty good like trade off, uh, especially for like the high incomes people are making. Um, and then it's really just figuring out, do I want to pay these costs? And if not, like what costs am I willing to pay to like find a new way forward? Wandering in an uncertain journey sort of sucks, especially at first. You feel terrible, society dismisses you, and people will judge you. But you might find a certain sense of aliveness, connectedness, and like energy that is like amazing. And that's sort of what I've found. And I just am want to share like my own single example with people. And I hope there's like a hundred more books like this soon. Absolutely. And it's not only an attempt, I can speak for myself only, of course, but it's a great success. And it really is inspiring. And another question that comes to mind while we talk about it, Paul, is other than buying or gifting the pathless path book to someone you actually care about, is there something I know you're not a big fan of generalizing, neither am I, but that you would suggest people in those high prestigious jobs working for MBB, working for investment banks, working in consulting, that you would suggest them to do or to listen to? Is there certain signs once they get a hinge or is there certain activities that you say, okay, once a year, try to reflect on your life? I don't know. Is there something that you would want to share? Yeah, it's hard to prescribe things for people. I think I wrote my book as sort of a 
a rest like here are like 25 different things i did to reflect and on my life i think there's value in just exposing yourself to these things and then saying oh this really resonates with me i want to try this right i think one of the simple things you can do like it's actually not like a reflection exercise we spend way too much time in our head and like people just over intellectualize these things Go for a walk without a destination. Go wander for minimum like two hours and no plan, no plan. Just like notice things. Just like look at roads and say, oh, I'm gonna go down this road. Don't go on a path you've gone before. Just wander anywhere. You can do this anywhere. There's no limits on this. Everyone can go take a walk, it's free. Um, and just like notice how you feel. Are you comfortable? What's making you uncomfortable? Like, do you hate the uncertainty of like not knowing where you're headed on a walk? And just, that's it. And then just like, see where that takes you. No, I really like that. I think that's a great hint to try out a two hour version of the pathless path, if you want to say, and if you already feel a lot of uncertainty, even though you're taking a walk in the city that you very well know, and in the city or in a place that you have seen multiple times before, it might give you a good hint what it is to live a life on a pathless path and without any certain direction. Paul, you also talk multiple times in your book about different areas of life, I want to call it. And I believe you had them pop up every morning at 8.30 on your phone. And that was health, relationships, fun, creativity, and career. I don't know if you still have them. And maybe we can go through those areas of life. Oh, they're still there. I don't know if you can see them. No, I cannot see it, but no. I trust you fully that they are there. Ah, <laughs> uh, there, there we go. go. Health relationships, fun creativity, <laughs> paid work. Wonderful. And is there a certain reason, the first question, for the order of those areas of life? And maybe we can talk to each of them a little bit. Yeah, I've had a lot of challenges over the last 10 years with my health. Um, more, most recently, like basically two years where I had like nerve issues and extreme fatigue um, related to some tooth issues. And without health, like nothing else really happens. Having your health at a bare minimum is like the right to like take on the day. <laughs> um, and then two, like without relationships, nothing really matters. When I w was out of work after business school, um, I sort of realized that I was already rich in family and relationships. And that like to live a full life, you really need to invest in those relationships. So a lot, a lot of people basically undermine their relationships by prioritizing work and money ahead of everything else. I'm willing to light a lot of economic and business opportunities on fire to like spend more time with friends. Um, I'm willing to drop the ball on stuff. If somebody says they're on town in town and they're a friend, like I want to meet up with them. Um, if people want to like connect with me and have conversations with me, I want to do that over like pushing my own goals. And I just think that's so important. And I found for me that works really well. It leaves me with a lot of excitement and energy for life such that I can then create. Right. And then last is paid work. People think paid work needs to be first. But when you prioritize the other stuff, you actually have the energy to do work that can get you paid. And for me, I'm just, I don't need that much material possessions. Like compared to the average American, I live on way less to be damn happy. And probably the average person in your country too. <laughs> like I just need, I just need way less. Like the expectations of the average person in today's world is insane. Like I just need some friends, some free time and like, I'm just so happy. <laughs> and having less feels super liberating, at least for myself. I can give you the example again. Justina and I were traveling last year to Thailand and to Sri Lanka, Nepal, and we were coming back. And both of us had our suitcase, so hand luggage, and we were carrying one big backpack. 
basically, um, with clothing, with stuff we have. Because, I mean, we have studio equipment for podcasts. I have my gym with me. It's like some rings I use for my calisthenics. Then because of my diet, I carry quite a bit of supplements like vegan, vegan protein powder. So there's already not a lot of space. But coming back from Asia, we realized that having this huge backpack is something that we don't want to have anymore. And we took the decision to go down to only hand luggage. And it feels so liberating. I mean, by now, I literally have five underwear. I have two pants. I have two t-shirts. I have a shirt. And that's pretty much everything that's left. There's a lot of equipment in our hand luggage, but I can certainly confirm that it can feel so nice. I mean, in the end, who cares, right? I have a t-shirt that I wear for my podcast and I have two t-shirts that I can wear for anything else. And in the end, having all those possessions is something, at least for me, that was not liberating, but the exact opposite. For sure. That's that's amazing. We've probably gone in the other direction and gotten bigger suitcases, but uh, it's all about defining like what you want. Exactly right. And then pursuing that. Absolutely. Detailing those areas of life a little bit, you talk to them, but is there certain things that you do to stay healthy and keep yourself fit mentally and physically, Paul? Yeah, I just try to work out most days and eat healthy. I don't drink. Um, a lot of what I do is centered around trying to be in high energy states and happy. Um, so I do a lot of the basic stuff. Is that something and that's personal interest that changed when you endeavored onto the pathless path. I don't know how it is for you, but for myself, especially the last few years of strategy consulting, I told myself after N hours, let's just call it long hours working, I don't feel like going to the hotel gym anymore. And I kind of neglected the whole health and physical exercise game a little bit. Is that something that came back for you as well? Joining or endeavoring on the pathless path? Yeah, for sure. Uh one thing I noticed is that like drinking kind of fell out of my life, which made me think a big part of drinking, especially in the States is tied to like the work week culture. Um, and, and, um, yeah, the, I think I've noticed this in a lot of self-employed people and it's just like, if you want to do your own work, you need a lot of energy. Out of a full-time job, you can kind of like just flow throughout the day. And you can do work you're not super excited by because you're just kind of like forced to show up and do it and held accountable to other people. On your own, like you need a lot higher motivation to do stuff. So like protecting your energy and exercise and like food and diet is so important. Absolutely. And if you have that full time job, and even though if it's double the amount of 40 hours a week, you may as well just have a beer or 10 after being done and then starting all over the next day, which is something that you may not be able to do or not willing to do if you work for yourself and if you actually need this energy. So I 100% agree with having a good diet and drinking less, if not, not at all. So I think that makes perfect sense. And in the end, uh, our bodies will thank us not only tomorrow, but also in 10 years from now, I believe. <laughs> For sure. Wonderful. And talking about relationships, that's also something connections, relationships that I value a whole lot. And you're also an avid traveler, I want to say. So I don't know, is there certain techniques or things that you do in order to nurture your relationships that you have with people? Or is it that you try or try not to build, create new relationships? I could imagine that on this pathless path you get to know interesting people more likely than on your normal nine to five office job where you always hang out with the same people but how do you deal with new relationships and how do you deal with relationships that you have since whatsoever long yeah i, I writing online attracts certain kind of people that vibe with like what i'm writing about and what i'm curious about so it's led to amazing friendships I'm basically somebody that likes to keep in touch with a lot of people, text my friends all the time, text people when I think of them. So like, I'm naturally like pretty wired for that. Um, there's no like conscious thing I'm doing. That's just like who I've always been. 
Um, so it fits really well for this kind of path. It certainly does. It certainly does. Uh, something I've realized when leaving this traditional path is that I didn't have the, let's say, four, five, six hours of traveling per week, which I usually used to chat or at least answer messages on my smartphone to get back to people and to nurture those relationships that I have. So I believe we are similarly wired there that keeping good relationships is something that gives us energy. Um, I've just yeah had like a birthday celebration, which didn't go through for more than two years due to the pandemic. And it was actually planned for roughly 60 people. Now we've been 21 people and it was super amazing. It was very intimate. It was like getting people from all different corners of my life. And there were people whom I knew for one and a half years. And there were people whom I knew for more than 20 years. And all of them coming together, having a wonderful weekend, just gave me so much energy, right? Just connecting them and seeing how they deal together with. So I think relationships are something that I also really do value. Wonderful. Amazing. <laughs> I have another question. And I believe that you've done quite a few reflection yourself. And I don't know if you can or if you want to talk to that. But if I would ask you for your core values, Paul, what is it that comes to mind? Or what are those? I think I would reframe it as like yearnings. Like what are the things I'm really drawn towards? Like I think I think one that I don't seem to have much control over is like freedom. I need a lot of autonomy and control over my life. Like I don't want to be reporting to other people. That was a detour. I don't want to go on again. <laughs> and um, creative expression is something that's important to me. Like ideas is like a value that matters to me. Like really exploring ideas, not like the open-minded nonsense that people claim to be. Like I'm open-minded as long as you're like believing these narrow set of ideas. Um, it's like really exploring ideas and like considering different people's viewpoints, the best possible views of different people. Um, generosity is important to me, like giving, finding ways to give um, in ways that are unexpected is important to me and like trying to just contribute and be a positive impact on like the communities and ecosystems I'm a part of. Those are probably a few of the things. No, oh, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you for that elaboration and for sharing that. And one thing that comes to mind is you talk about freedom and autonomy. And one more thing I take from the book is a quote that you say, after more than three decades of constantly planning for the future, I was able to start living in the present. I think we've talked about planning quite a bit and why this is not the thing, but how do yeah. you live a present life? And is that something that is always there or is there also some boundaries to being present for yourself? Unconventional paths are great for this because it removes the false story that like you're on some sort of path, right? The default path comes with all these narratives and stories that like, oh, I'm on a career path to the top of an organization or like, oh, I have this growth opportunity at a company. They're all kind of like illusory. But yeah, I, I think on the path of path, like you can try to make plans, but nothing really goes as you plan. <laughs> And you quickly realize like all you can do is kind of control the day and it forces you to live in the present. I think also just taking breaks from working mode. So like worker mode is like this state where like you're constantly busy. You're always thinking about the next step. You're always thinking about future outcomes and figuring out how can you take breaks from your, from that mode in your life and just show up and kind of like go for that walk, right? Go for that wander and just see what happens. Just like reconnect with yourself. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a full month or a three month sabbatical that you go for that break, right? It can start with a walk. And if certain ideas and thoughts come rise up during that walk, you may want to have a week off for yourself and reflect. And then maybe you go for the month and then you maybe figure out that you don't need to have a longer break, but have those pausing points, if you want to say, I believe is something that really can help people living a happier and more exciting life. Fully agree. Yeah, I, I think a month is actually probably the minimum to disconnect from worker mode. This stuff is so deep in our culture 
that we don't even know it's there until we take a break from it. Um, so I think it's hard, but I think it's doable for most people. If most people said I needed to take a month to create space in my life at one point in my like thirties, you could do it. Um, I just think people are just so tied into the matrix that it's hard for them to think they can actually escape. And again, I think you've given great examples why it actually works. And there is a lot of people who have taken this pause and who have used this pause to rethink their paths and their connections. That makes perfect sense. For sure. Paul, there is three questions that I ask each and every one of my podcast guests at the end of my podcast. But before we go there, I actually have two rather odd, if you want to say, questions. And that is because I figured out when preparing for this conversation that we share also some readings and some books. So my first question would be, what do you like about Erich Fromm and why is that? Ah, so that's how you actually pronounce it? <laughs> Erich Fromm? Um, I've been saying it wrong. Um, <clears throat> so two books. Two books, Escape from Freedom and The Art of Loving, are basically his like 20 year journey to like figure out like what, how do you find meaning in life. I think he was deeply curious about this sort of existential void that emerged after religion fell out of reality as like the central meaning making mode. And he saw that all over the world in like in political economies that were like fascist, democratic, um, authoritarian, socialist, people would basically give up their meaning making to authorities. So in, in Western worlds, it was like through consumerism or like conforming to what other people were doing in fascist economies, like, or socialist, it was like just giving yourself to like the the like craziness of the masses and like the narratives and the propaganda and this tendency to like give up responsibility for like your own life to other people is just sort of a human thing. And he was kind of dumbfounded writing about this in escape from freedom during world war two. Um, but I think it's interesting reading the art of loving um, written almost 20 years later, where he argues that like, finding a state where you can experience love might be a way out of this. And one of the ways he says you can experience love is through the art of creation. And he gives other like formulas as well. And the art of creation, he argues, is the way you can experience connectedness to yourself, your work and the universe. And it seems crazy, but I think it's true. And many artists, if you read throughout history, artists, creators, writers, all write about this, like deep connectedness to the universe. And it's pretty cool. Like if this exists, it might be worth trying to find. Absolutely. Absolutely. I fully agree. And I very much agree as well that those two books still hold a lot of wisdom or truth in them and that they are very worthwhile reading. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing those thoughts, Paul. And that brings me to the other question is, what are the books, Paul, that you frequently gift or that you like to recommend to other people? I don't know if there's something on your bookshelf right now, or if there is like all time classics. Uh, my most gifted book is probably my book. Now I've, I think I've gifted it to like 400 people. But Yeah, I, I think the books I recommend most are probably like Tuesdays with Maury. That book has inspired me a lot. Um, at one point, Clayton Christensen's How Will You Measure Your Life was one I really liked. Others are, yeah, those are probably the two most recommended. So that's like a different way of answering that. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And first of my final questions, Paul, for you is who influenced you and what motivated you over the past week? The past week. Oh, geez. Um, it's often just talking to people, carving different paths. 
So I talked to uh, Shivani Shah last night, who's been writing about her journey, and she's leaving her job at Google to carve a new path. And it was just, I, I was so pumped to like hear her story and just really excited about like what she was embarking on. So that's somebody that motivated me in the past week. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And it sounds like an inspiring story you guys exchanged last night. And that kind of links to the second question. And that is, Paul, who are your mentors or whom do you look up to? Um, I get a lot of inspiration from like Venkatesh Rao. I like how he's carving like a weird indie path and not optimizing for like extreme success. Um, Tom Critchlow is great on thinking about like freelancing and indie paths. Um, I love following people like Ali Abdal, like Tiago Forte, Dave Perel, and Laura LeCompf, who are like all taking these weird solopreneur paths, but doing it with like different ingredients. Like Kay He is somebody I look to a lot. They're really like peers on similar paths. Um, and it's like you're always looking for like new ideas for like how to think about your path, things to like things to do to create, to like make money and like make your path worthwhile. Um, so those are some, some of the people. And then like, I have a lot of like personal mentors I look up to. Um, there's a few like older men in my life that I just look to as like role models for like how to be an active and engaged parent and uh, adult in the world. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that on your mentors and the people whom you look up to. And that leads us to the last and final question. And that is a rather hypothetical one, Paul. So I would like you to imagine a scenario where you are traveling all by yourself in space and you're traveling for several months or even several years. And I call this question, the three truths. So after all that travel that you've done by yourself, you experience a human like species and they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide they, whether they want to get to know us or not. What do you tell them? That's such a hard question. Um, I think one is like the ability to imagine new futures. Um, is probably one, the ability to create, um, new paths, new ways of living life and, um, humor probably. A lot of creation and humor. I love that Paul. And thank you very creation, much. Creation, imagination and humor. <laughs> Wonderful. I love that. Thank you very much for that answer. And thanks for being a guest on the Just Another Mindset podcast. And if there is anything that you would like to share with the audience, the stage is yours. Yeah, check out my book, The Pathless Path, um, or check out my newsletter, boundless.substack.com. Good ways to follow along and uh, find out what I'm up to. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. And have a wonderful day. Thank you. If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.